Monday, once again. I like that Mamas and Papa song, Monday, Monday. So good to me. Well, for 40 something years I've been preaching and wondering why. The title of this message is The Big Prisoner. Ephesians 3 1. We're going to have to do better. That TV show is not going to sound very good. John, can you, Josh, can you add some fake applause for me? Please. Well, them, them folks in Nacogdoches, they really get with it. The ones in Livingston are even better. They keep saying, why don't you tell Josh to come film down here? We, because it's so far to drive. You know? But they applaud. Starting in verse 1, Ephesians 3, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner, the big prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you word, how that by revelation, very important word, he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, and partakers of the same promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister, according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me who am least, am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Anybody that's not Jewish by birth is a Gentile. It doesn't matter what color you are. And to make all men see, that means to understand, what is the fellowship <coughs> excuse me, of the mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom or many-sided wisdom of God. Let's go back to verse 1. If you're taking notes, I hope you are. Therefore you. Point number one is here's why. Paul calls himself a prisoner. Now I know that none of you in this room have ever been to jail, but it was those other people that were here last week. They understand what a prisoner is. A prisoner is someone who does what he's told when he's told to do it. Any of you all know what I'm talking about? There's a couple of honest people in here anyway. A prisoner is someone who obeys. They tell you when to eat. They tell you when to sleep. They tell you when to get up. They tell you when to recreate. They tell you everything, don't they? And if you don't obey, what happens? There's consequences, right? Well, that's what a prisoner is. And we are to be, as Christians, if you're a Christian, to be a prisoner of Christ. Therefore, we don't do what we want to do. We don't do it when we want to do it. And I know some of you are going to nod your heads at me, but then you're going to go out of here and do exactly the opposite of what's being said. And the first thing you're going to do is hit the smoking deck. And call yourself a Christian. But nobody will believe it. And if you really want them to, then you need to get rid of that ugly habit. And don't tell me it's hard. I know. I used to smoke. I know it's hard. But you can do it. And guess what? I'm going to let you know a little secret. If you were to quit smoking this minute, never smoke again, it would not kill you. In fact, you might actually live longer. You might even live better. Healthier. Who knows, you might start running marathons next year. I don't know. I want people that come along and tell me they love Jesus, but they get drunk. And God says, don't be drunk. What's the best way not to get drunk? Don't drink. Simple. 
Makes infinite sense, but most people can't figure that out. <clears throat> he says, God is my jailer, I'm a prisoner, and I am now, by God's choice, the pr prisoner of Christ to be a servant for you Gentiles. It's like me. I am working at God Tell. I've been here 39 years. Some people say, Brother June, how did you manage to last 39 years and you preach about nine times a week and you don't get tired? I say, that's because I don't do things I'm not supposed to be doing. I've got preacher friends that have trouble preaching two or three times a week because they're constantly playing golf. And they're going on trips, ski trips, and here and there and yonder. And they're always coming back tired and looking like they've been beat up. You don't get tired doing God's work if you're not doing all the extra stuff you'd like to do that you weren't supposed to do. You have plenty of time for God's work unless you fill your time up with junk that you don't need. And people just don't understand that. They can't figure it out. Because we live in America and you're supposed to have fun. I mean, it's written somewhere. We've got to find out where it's written. You're supposed to have fun. Fun, fun, fun till daddy takes a T-bird away. That's what we think. But there's nothing in the Bible that says we're ever supposed to have any fun. There's nothing in the Bible that says you're supposed to be happy. It declares that if you obey God, you will be blessed, which means happy, if you obey God. So he says, listen, God has given me grace to bring to you. It's not his grace, it's God's grace. Paul was just a vessel to be used to speak words that would bring them to Christ so they could know the grace of God in Christ. Listen, I got a great mystery I want to tell you about. Point number two, a mystery. God revealed a great mystery. I'm supposed to tell you about this thing. A mystery, I'm going to tell you at the end of the sermon why there was a mystery. And I want you to understand my knowledge in this mystery of Christ, which was revealed. I got it by revelation. I, you know, folks, God does not place a premium on ignorance. You ought to, you know, read, study, learn. That's good for you. But you need to also understand this. You can never know God through books. You can never know God by going to a cemetery. I mean a seminary, excuse me. I talk to people all the time. I've, for years, I've talked to young people going to seminary. I said, why are you going to seminary? Oh, I want to become a preacher. Why do you want to become a preacher? Oh, I think that would be a good vocation. And I usually tell them something like, why don't you sell insurance or cars instead? Preachers aren't worth anything unless they're called of God. And God does not call people just because they went to a seminary. He calls what he wants to call. I remember when I first got saved and God called me to preach. I just knew that God had made a mistake. I said, there's something wrong with God. He called me. He made a big mistake. God, there are other people out there that can do this job better than me. They're smarter. They can do it better. And God says, yes, I know. But I don't want them. I want you to do this job. And I'll never forget. I was reading in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 16. And I read this verse. It says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Whoa, that's pretty good. I've chosen you to bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. And I've never forgotten that verse. I didn't want to be a preacher. I don't know too many preachers that are worth their salt that ever wanted to be preachers. And I'm suspicious of the ones that say, oh yeah, yippee yay, I got up one morning and I just knew I wanted to be a preacher, yes. I worry about them fellas because I think some of them are in it for the wrong reasons. I preach because I don't have a choice. Paul preached, the greatest apostle that ever lived, and he told us in the book of 2 Corinthians that he preached because he didn't have any choice. Paul didn't want to preach. He's probably like me, want to take a long vacation. But then he decided to obey God. Because the only peace you can have in your heart is when you obey God. Right. Oh, you can do all kinds of things and you can look good to the world, but you won't have any peace in your heart. And all that stuff won't mean anything. It won't have any real value. There's nothing wrong particularly with playing golf. I think it's a stupid game. 
Why would a grown, mature, intellectual person take a little white ball that never did a minute's harm to them, put it on top of a little tiny tower, and then take this big old club and whack the thing as hard as it can do it, and then go out and look for it? I just pick the thing up and put it in my pocket. I know where it is. I don't have to go out looking for it. To me, it's kind of a silly game, you know? I told some guys this morning, I, was, I have some friends that I visit with once a week up there in Nacogdoches, two of them are golfers, they like to play golf. And I told them, I said, you know, one of these days, just so I can say I did it, I'm gonna go to one of your country clubs, pay the green fees, rent some clubs, and I'm gonna go out there, I'm gonna play one round of golf. Just so I can say I did it. The problem is I'll probably do so well they wanna put me on a circuit. <laughs> Probably have a lot of that, yeah. Sports to me is kind of a waste of time. Some people like it, that's fine, that's their business between them and God. But I want to tell you something, most people I know that do all this kind of stuff are always tired. And they don't have time for God. And sometimes they can't even get up to go to church on Sunday because they're tired. And I've seen some of these people are sick, I'm too sick to go to church. But they weren't too sick on Friday to play golf. I think that's really interesting. So you need to understand that the knowledge of God, to really understand God, comes by revelation. I've met and I've talked to and I've read great scholars, Hebrew, Greek scholars in the world. Some of them are out to lunch when it comes to knowing God. They know the words, but they have no personal relationship. <clears throat> it's not important to, you know, some of these guys think it, boy, if you don't learn how to read Greek and Hebrew, you'll never know what the Bible says. Well, you know what? I learned a long time ago that God was smart enough to give us a book in a language we could understand. I was studying Greek and Hebrew at one time, and then I decided, you know, this is a waste of time. Nobody really knows exactly what the Hebrew language was all about exactly because there were no vowels in the Hebrew language and Old Hebrew and there was no punctuation, no chapter divisions. The readers had to supply the vowels as they read. And they could do that because they understood the language. We can get a glimpse of it. But if you just read, for instance, the King James Bible, which I like the best, and read it in context, you'll know what God's talking about. You won't have to wonder. <clears throat> so God... Did not reveal this in other times, but he revealed it now. Point number three, brothers. The mystery is that the Gentiles could also get saved, just like the Jews. The Jews, though, based on their tradition, thought they were the only ones going to heaven. Even though the Old Testament deals with this issue and talks about it, but they didn't understand it. And there was a reason for that, as you're going to see in a minute. They did not understand and. You can read over in the book of Isaiah, for instance. It talks about the Gentiles. And there's a lot of things in the Bible that we don't understand until time goes by and then we go, oh yeah, that's what that is. I've been watching Egypt. Because the Bible talks about Egypt's going to become a friend of Israel in the last days. And it's interesting that about two or three weeks ago, 21 Christians were beheaded by the Islamic group over there. They're Muslim, and the Egyptian basically is a Muslim country. And the president of Egypt, who is a Muslim, sent troops out to go hunt those guys down. Well, that's interesting. In any other Muslim country, nobody would hunt them down. <coughs> but it's going to change. It's going to be God's friend one of these days. And there's going to be a lot of people saved. It's always been this way, but they didn't have the light. They didn't have the understanding. They just knew the words. God sent me to tell you and to reveal his power. You know, I often wonder why I, what I'm doing here, you know. And I'm sure Paul felt the same way. I know Jesus felt that way because he asked his disciples one day, he said, are you going to leave too? He was down to 12. He never had a big church. You see some of these guys with 40,000 members and you wonder why are they following him? They wouldn't even follow God. <laughs> But well, people follow personalities. And if you can tell people enough of what they want to hear, they'll follow you. 
and they'll give you your money. Why do you think those TV preachers always tell you nice things? You know, I'd love to see a TV preacher one day. I turn on the set and the TV preacher says, you know, there's a whole bunch of wicked people that act like the north end of southbound mule watching this program right now. And I wish you all would repent and get right or God would just strike you dead. Wouldn't that be something? Well, that's what's in the Bible. David prayed like that. But you won't hear the TV preacher. That's bad for business. You can't raise money that way. Can you imagine saying, I'm praying God will kill you. Send me $10. <laughs> That'll go over real big, wouldn't it? <clears throat> God sent Paul to reveal this message, this awesome, awesome mes message, which was a mystery that the Gentiles, that the Jews, that the blacks, the whites, the Mexicans, the Chinese, and if there's any people from Mars and they're green, them too. Everybody gets saved the same way. There's no different way to get saved. A lot of preachers, unfortunately, they just preach traditions. They don't preach the truth. I was talking to a man one day. He walked into my place up there at Nacogdoches, our, our mission up there. And he walked in and he says, Brother June, he was a lay preacher. He said, Brother June, there's a bunch of pastors meeting over at the courthouse. We want you to come over there with us. We're going to protest abortion. I said, man, I don't, I don't want to go. He said, why not? I said, because I've got too much to do here. He said, well, are you, you in favor of abortion? I said, you know better than that. I said, I just don't want to go. I've got work to do right here. <clears throat> well, you need to come with us. We need to be unified. I said, look, I don't want to. He kept pushing me. I hate it when people do that. I said, no. I said, look, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't want to be seen on that corner with you and them other preachers. He said, why not? I said, because I know that none of you know what you're talking about. He just looked at me and said, what do you mean? I said, well, you believe in the age of accountability. That's a, that's a doctrine that's been preached in a lot of churches. Baptists have preached it for years. And that means that if a baby dies, it automatically goes to heaven. It's very comforting to people. But is it really true? That's the question. I said, you believe in the age of accountability? He says, yep. I said, you believe that if a baby dies, it automatically goes to heaven? He says, right. I said, then why would you want to stop abortion? Do you ever think about that? If you really believe that the babies automatically died and went to heaven, why not just let them go to heaven? Boy, he didn't know what to do with that. He, he says, well, uh, you know, he's him hawing, stammering. And he said, I said, you know what's going to happen? You're going to go down there and you're going to save some baby from being aborted and he's going to grow up and die and go to hell and it's going to be your fault. <laughs> By then he was shaking. <laughs> And he said, well, Brother June, why are you against abortion? I said, because I don't believe in the age of accountability. And I know I can't preach to people if they're dead. So I'm trying to rescue as many as I can so they can hear the word of God. Well, he just, I mean, he was visibly shaken up by this whole thing. I said, on top of that, I'm going to tell you something. If the age of accountability was true and those babies automatically went to heaven, then I'd be mad at God that I wasn't stillborn because I didn't want to be here in the first place. And I sure didn't want to go through all the hell I went through to get saved. He says, well, what, what happens to the babies? I said, it's simple. God dwells in non-linear time. And God knows the end in the beginning, doesn't he? That means he has foreknowledge. And God is perfect, so his foreknowledge has to be perfect. God doesn't judge little babies. He judges them as though they had grown up. Because he knows what decision they would make before they could make it. That's why it tells us that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world. But most people never think that through. They just keep preaching their traditions. God judges everybody the same. Salvation is identically the same for everybody. Our problem is we don't want to trust God that he knows what he's doing. God is perfectly, absolutely, and abundantly fair. He's not going to give somebody a free pass just because they died in infancy and then let somebody, because they're 40 years old, die and go to hell because they didn't walk down front of a church and say, I want Jesus. He's going to judge everybody exactly the same. God is fair. You all believe that? 
He's fair. I don't get worried about it. God knows what he's doing. He knows the decision those babies would make before they ever got old enough to make it. I trust that God knows what he's doing. And I just leave it there. And I don't worry about it. I sleep good at night. I'm not all upset. And I don't go around trying to stop stuff that doesn't make sense. If you don't believe in the age of accountability, then you would definitely want to be against abortion. You want to give them every opportunity to get saved. Even though, from God's point of view, everything's already done. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3 says that all of God's works were finished before the world. All of them. He knew what we'd be doing here tonight. He knows what you're thinking tomorrow. <laughs> he knows everything you do, even when you're alone in the shower. He knows everything. You're not going to surprise God. <laughs> People think, oh, I got by with that. God didn't see me. He sees everything. Right? right. He's God. See, most people got a little tiny God. They can kind of put him in their pocket and take him out when they're ready, you know. But God's not like that. You can't pin God up. Point number four. I'm nothing. The least. This is the greatest apostle that ever lived. And he says, I'm the least of all the saints. Paul understood what Brother Manley Beasley used to teach us. As we're nothing. And that's a zero with a rim knocked off. We're nothing. I was preaching on this subject one time, some years ago. And I don't want to offend anybody, but I'm going to tell you just exactly how it happened. I was talking about the fact that we were nothing. And we needed Christ. And there was a black fellow in the back of the congregation and he jumped up and yelled at me across everybody. He was mad. And he said, I'm a proud black man and you can't talk to me that way. And he walked out the door and I thought to myself, you know, he should have stayed and listened to the rest of the message. All he heard was the part he didn't like. If he had stayed and listened to the whole thing, he would have found out I wasn't just talking about him. I was talking about me. We are all what? Nothing. Nothing. And you ought to get up every morning, go look in the mirror, and the first thing you ought to do is say, hello, nothing. We're nothing. Outside of Christ, we have absolutely no value. Doesn't matter how big you are and how much money you make. God measures differently than man does. I have value only because Christ lives in me. Myself, zero. No value. Worthless. Not even worth the chemicals it took to put me together once they added water. Which is only about a $2 or something like that worth of chemicals. <laughs> worthless. Just worthless. Paul understood that. What made Paul so great was that he recognized this fact. The Bible says, when you think you stand, take heed lest you fall. Never think more highly of yourself than you ought to. Most of all puffed up think we're something. I watch some of these men. It's so funny. And I used to be like this before I was a Christian. Get up in the morning, you know, comb my eyebrows and everything, thinking I'm God's gift to the feminine sex. Can't wait to get out in the street and meet another one. And I knew I was good looking. I was. I still are. <laughs> if I was God, I'd make everybody look like me. Martin's going, good thing he ain't God. <laughs> And I've seen the women do that too. And then now they're, now they're painting themselves with poor man's investment in art, tattoos. Ladies, I don't mean to be offensive, but I, I can't stand it when I see a woman in shorts at the mall with cellulite hanging out everywhere, but she's got a bird tattooed on her leg. I guess she thinks that makes her cute. And all the guys look at that and go, Pfft. I'm telling you. You women don't know what goes on in a lot of men's heads. You think you do. They put on perfume. Most every man I've ever met hates perfume. But women wear it. And we gag. But then when we get up close to them, we say, oh, you smell so good. <laughs> we lie. We do. You know? I don't know why it is. We just can't be honest and say, hey, you stink. <laughs> well, we're trying to be polite, I guess. 
And I'm sure the women, I don't know women's minds too. I've been living with one for 42 years and I ain't got her figured out. And I probably never will. I think I'll get my bridge to Hawaii from California before I'll ever understand women. But I'm sure they think some weird stuff about us guys because we do some dumb things too. Thinking we're cool. And they're forgetting the 50s and 60s. We thought we were so manly and macho. That big cigarette hanging out of our mouth. Big bottle of suds over here in the left hand. Man, we was cool. Leaning up against the building there, propped up, waiting for some little lassie to walk by. Lassie did walk by and growled at us. Some of you will get that later. I'm the least important, but God chose me anyway. Hey, I understand that. I'm nothing. God chose me anyway. I don't know why. Every time I ask God why he loves me, he just says, I want to. He chooses to love me. He chooses to love you. And I look at you and I say, man, God, you love each one of these people. I don't know why, but you do. He does. And he paid the penalty for your sin so you could get into heaven. If you don't get into heaven, it's not God's fault. He did everything that was necessary to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. What that means there in verse 8 is that you cannot reach the end of the riches of Christ. You cannot drop your well into the spirit, your bucket into the spiritual well and hit the bottom. There is no bottom. You can never exhaust the riches of Christ. That's why he calls them unsearchable. It's to reveal all the possibilities in Christ for our lives, for holiness, and yet you cannot ever know all the possibilities. They're infinite. I was amazed just thinking about the piano. Every octave has 13 notes in it. 13 notes. And every other octave is just a repeat of the same 13 notes. And yet how many millions upon millions of tunes have been devised using those same 13 notes? The combinations are infinite, as far as I can see. And that's kind of the way it is with Christ. His love, His knowledge, His wisdom, His riches, His peace, His grace that He gives us, you can't reach the bottom of it. There's never an end. It's infinite. Some people think God's going to run out. He's going to run out of gas. You know, no, it's not going to happen. And to help us understand, using the word to see, what was from the beginning this is from the beginning that everybody could be saved but they didn't see it and that Jesus created all he created earth created the stars created the galaxies the universe he created the animals and even the ants and the smallest atomic structures he created everything John chapter 1 verse 1 in the beginning was the word the word was with God the word was God the same was in the beginning with God. That's verse 2. Verse 3 says, nothing was made except that it was made by Him. Jesus, He's God. Of course, there's some people that don't believe that. Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe that. They don't believe that Jesus is God. The Muslims don't believe that. They believe, if anything, He was a minor prophet. They pay Him no attention. They don't believe He was the Christ, the Anointed One. That's why they're Antichrist. It's just true. Jesus is God. He's the God of all. He's the God of the universe. And one day you're going to stand before him. Last point. Five. What's up? Now here's why there was a mystery. The mystery was revealed when Christ died and paid the penalty for our sin and rose from the dead. The mystery was kept a secret by God until the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ so Satan couldn't understand the plan of God. You see, all that time Satan thought he was going to win the war and he got Jesus on the cross. I mean, you got to understand what's going on behind it. The Bible says when Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus, Satan entered into his heart. And he went out and betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Well, the devil was working overtime trying to get Jesus killed. 
He tried many times to get him killed, never could, but he's trying again. And now he gets on the cross. He's crucified. And when Jesus dies on that cross, the devil goes, yeah, I win. I did it. I killed him. So the devil goes down to his place and he's having a big party. Man, the suds is flowing. The women are dancing all over the place. Guys in the back room playing pool. Got a card game going on. Everybody's happy. They're eating hot dogs and stuff and they're having a big time. And uh, they didn't have to look too far for the fire to roast the hot dogs. That was convenient. And they're in there just doing this dance. They're happy. They're just elated. They're partying. Champagne, toast, and all of a sudden they hear. <laughs> Satan looks around and says, I wonder who that is. Everybody's in here. Aren't they all in here? The demon standing next to him says, yeah, we're all here. We're all accounted for. <laughs> Get over there and open that door and see who that is. And the demon goes over and he opens the door and Jesus is standing there and says, hi, guys. I'm back. <laughs> you lose. The devil lost. That's where he lost. Jesus fought two battles. One of them was a battle with the flesh, which he won in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then when he went to the cross and submitted to that horrendous death, he whipped the devil. You see, the devil thought he was going to come as a king and conquer the Romans, and that's what the Jews all thought too. But Jesus didn't come to do that. He came to die and pay the penalty for our sin. And that's what Satan didn't understand. Satan... Helped us get salvation by giving Jesus a leg up on the cross. He said, I'm going to get you now, man. Jesus said, oh, yeah. Father, he talked to the people down there. He says, forgive them. They know not what they do. <laughs> Have you ever thought that through? They don't know that by killing me, they're fulfilling the very plan of God. They don't know what they're doing. They think they're getting rid of me. They don't know that in three days I'll be back. <laughs> well, that's what the Bible says. Jesus went to the cross for the joy that was set before him. The joy wasn't going to the cross. The joy was what was coming after the cross. He knew about the resurrection, and the devil, the dummy, didn't. <laughs> he said, you're supposed to be dead. He said, yeah, everybody thought that, but I'm not. I'm alive. And you know, Christianity is the only religion that has a living Savior. Everybody else's is dead. All the prophets of all the religions are all dead. But Jesus is alive. And he can still change people if they would just let him. Sometimes I wonder, you know, I preach and preach and preach and very few people, you know, somebody gets saved along the way and uh, I get really excited when I see that. That's a neat thing. But most people, most of you, will go out of here tonight and you will live exactly like you were living before. I had a guy walking to me after church today. He said, oh, Brother June, that was a great message. I said, we'll see. What do you mean? I said, if it changes your life, it was a great message. If you just live the way you've been living and nothing changes, maybe it wasn't so good. What is the point? Well, for me, the point is, whether you get saved or lost, stay lost is irrelevant because I do my job and God's going to be happy with me. But boy, what a day it's going to be to stand before God and say, I ignored every sermon I ever heard. Every chance that Jesus, through the Spirit, came to me and offered me salvation, I said no. It's going to be a hard day, isn't it? To stand before God and then watch him say, you know, there's two doors over there. You take the left one. The one that says hell. And you'll be there forever. Ever. You can't exhaust that either. It's forever. Constantly being tormented, confessing constantly that Jesus is Lord and God's just not listening. Now that's what you want. You can have it. And while you're here on earth, I'll smile at you. But there's coming a day when you're going to have to deal with God, not me. If you don't wise up, 
you're going to regret it forever. And if you're a Christian, you're going to moan and groan when you stand before God over missed opportunities. You see, you, you need to have the best possible testimony. You ought to be acting right. You ought to get rid of the nasty stuff that comes out of your mouth, the mean-spirited junk. We all have it. In fact, I was mad the other day. There's people up the Nacogdoches mission, and I told them, I said, you know what? If reincarnation was true, I want to come back as an assassin. An invisible assassin. And there's going to be dead bodies everywhere. <laughs> I was upset. But of course, I don't believe in reincarnation anyway. And I don't believe that I would be an assassin. But it did make me feel better to say that. What I want to do is get out of here and go to be with Jesus and quit fooling with folks. I don't get tired of preaching. I don't get tired of doing my job. But I do get tired of some of you because you don't listen. And that bothers me. You know, just the people in this room, if you all got right with God, we could turn this town upside down. Oh, they'd think we're crazy, but that's okay. We won't be any crazier than we are. We'll just be a little different crazier. God's purpose in hiding the secret was to fool Satan's plan or foil Satan's plan until Jesus paid for sin. Last line, devil defeated. He is defeated. We are victorious. We win. We win because Jesus won. And if the devil ever comes into my life, it'll be because... He's a second-rate messenger boy, and God said, you know, Brother June down there getting a little proud. Go give him a little problem. And I recognize that when God does that, it's always for my good, not to hurt me. Read the book of Job sometime. It explains all of that. Father, we thank you for loving us. And again tonight, I thank you for each one in this room. I hope they're listening. We try each week to put things in terms that they can understand and yet we don't see much change in people and I thank you that I'm not responsible for that I'm only responsible to deliver a message and I rejoice in doing that not because I particularly like to preach not particularly because I like to tell people what they don't want to hear but because I know I'm pleasing you and that's all that I really want to do. Not perfect, and I don't always get it right. But that's the desire of my heart. To be satisfied with Jesus, and hopefully Jesus will be satisfied with me. We thank you that our Lord paid the penalty for our sin and rose from the dead. We're so grateful that we know in our hearts that he's coming back. So we pray even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. This world can't go on much longer like it is. It's ripping itself apart. And yet at the same time we know that everything is under your control. And so we hope the end comes soon. There's nothing really that we need to do except if we have to be here for a while longer to keep on preaching. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for meeting our needs the way you have. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen.